one person. Today. I thought Mitsubishi is the government. <laughs> uh, and then Minister Lutfi, who is very well known to, uh, to all of you, I'm sure, the Minister of Trade of Indonesia. Thank you, Minister, because I know how hard you had to travel to get here this morning. I think you arrived very, very early this morning. So thank you so much for the effort you made to join our session. Uh, and then may I introduce Senior Minister Champo, uh, who is the Senior Minister and Minister of Commerce of Cambodia. Uh, and then Senior Minister Tio, who is the Senior Minister of State uh, in the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Transport in Singapore. So perfectly aligned to our topics today. So let me begin the discussion by asking some questions. I will allow time towards the end for the audience to also ask questions. But let me begin uh, by asking questions to our panel. So first, if I may turn to you, Secretary Domingo, um, to give an initial overview of um, how you see from the Philippines' perspective the progress on the ASEAN economic community uh, and the likelihood of implementation in 2015. You know, how, what is the Philippines' perspective uh, of where we are to date and the benefits that will accrue? to the Philippines economy from the AEC. Yes, uh, well, from, uh, from the trade minister's perspective, uh, we, we look at, uh, there are many components to AEC 2015, but the, from the trade minister's perspective, we're looking at trade in goods, trade in services, trade in, I mean, in, in the investments uh, section. Uh, trade in goods has basically been accomplished four years ago, January 1, 2010, wherein ASEAN as a whole reduced its tariffs on over 99% of goods for the ASEAN 6, the original 6, to 0%. While for the rest, the CLM, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, uh, uh, they already have 98% of their tariff lines reduced to zero as of January 1, 2010. So come, come next year, December 31, 2015, there are really very few items left to reduce. So from a trade in goods perspective, we have basically accomplished it already. We are already here competing with goods from ASEAN uh, in the Philippines. We already imported zero duty. Uh, the, the only remaining thing there is really the non-tariff barriers. These are rules and regulations that block trade that are perceived, okay? We, we shouldn't judge prematurely, but are perceived to be blocking trade. So ASEAN is, is working on removing, removing those non-tariff barriers. Uh, the bulk of the work that's being done now by ASEAN, I mean, I'd like maybe the other ASEAN ministers can confirm, is really on the trade and services side, wherein we're working on uh, 10 packages. We've basically completed eight. We're working on the ninth and trying to finish the tenth by the end of next year. These are liberalization in terms of the services area. And the uh, particular focus there is uh, on uh, allowing a certain minimum equity to come in to those services sectors that have been identified, which are over 150 service sectors. Uh, as of now, I think 104 of the 158 uh, service sectors have been completed. So we will continue to work on the, on the rest of those. And then on the investments side, actually the trade and services already tackled the investments uh, right. side. But on the investment side, it talks more about the promotions, efforts, uh, etc. So that's, that's really where we stand. Of course, a lot of other things are, being, are happening on the transport side, uh, where liberalization of air services. You're on the financial services side, where you're talking about insurance and banking regulations that have to be harmonized and as well as liberalized. Thank you. And so now, if I may turn to Minister Lutfi, the biggest economy in ASEAN, um, and what is the perspective of Indonesia on the progress to date with the AEC, and how do you see the uh, changes in the Indonesian economy that will uh, accrue as a result of implementation of the AEC? Thank you, Rajiv. I thought it was a sequence. So, one sequence. Well, the way Indonesia see it. Is there a problem? Huge problem. Why? Study shows about 80% of Indonesian understand ASEAN, but only less than 5% knows about AEC. 
So is that a problem? Yeah, when there is less than 5%, of course it's a problem. But what is going to happen? Like Secretary Domingo says, what happened by January 1st, 2015? Nothing. Because 99.6% of the tariff is zero. Okay? So what does Indonesia see about this? Well, this is my personal opinion, does not reflect probably my opinion of my colleague ministers here on the, on the stage. Indonesia sees that the robust uh, growth of middle class where the number says the people that earn that uh, earn about 3,000 to 5,000 by Nomura security reach 140 million. This is three times the size of middle class in the Philippines, five times the size of middle class in uh, Thailand, about six times the class of middle class in Malaysia. Why 3,000 and 5,000 is important? $3,000 uh, combined with the wife around 5,000 means second televisions in the household. $5,000 mean a first car in the household. And because of that, you look at the number. If you look at Japan, of every thousand numbers, 582 cars. In Thailand, which is we are going to be like Thailand, is 169 cars per thousand people. Do you know how many cars in Jakarta, in Indonesia? 40 cars in a thousand. What does that mean? we're going to grow four times just to reach Thailand. What does that mean? That means Jakarta traffic will be much worse than what it is today. Okay? So, but what does that mean for, people, for companies like Mitsubishi, like Toyota, like Daihatsu, like Suzuki? They double the number. Mitsubishi cars double the number. Toyota double the number. Uh, Daihatsu. Uh, the, the production, the, the, the capacity of Daihatsu in Indonesia by 2017 is bigger than Japan. Uh, Honda doubled the capacity, uh, Suzuki uh, more than doubled the capacity. The one that is not, not, not investing in the country is Mazda. It's their fault, it's not my fault. Okay? <laughs> so, this is the way I see it. So, Japan, in the first wave of industrialization in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, is they come to Indonesia to get cheap labor. Take the, take the goods for developed market. Today, Japanese come to Indonesia for survival, to tap our robust middle class. So this is I'm, what I'm going to see. So what happened with ASEAN? So now, Indonesia right now, it's like giving its market, seems like giving its market. But you know, we've been doing this for the last four or five years. But I see this is a, this is a change because the investment is heavy. When, uh, well, before this, this is a good friend because I was an amb Indonesian ambassador in Tokyo. When I came, when I came to Tokyo, the realizations of Japanese investment $750. When I left, $4.7 billion. Not because of the ambassador, but this is survival. Because of that, Indonesia transitions now from market coming in because the robust middle class suddenly changing to be a source of production in the region. So now, Listen, Cambodia. Listen, Malaysia and Philippines. I'm exporting the traffic jams from Jakarta. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> That's my take, Rajiv. Thank you. Um, if I could turn to you, Senior Minister Chantal, and get the Cambodian perspective. Uh, in particular, I want to ask about the ASEAN free trade area implementation in Cambodia, and what is the impact on your country? And you know, what are the positives? What are the negatives? What is the reaction of stakeholders in Cambodia uh, to the AFTA? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think so, as one of said, uh, the said, uh, Secretary Domingo so uh, said it, uh, up to 99% of the tariff lines are being removed up to zero for the ASEAN 6. And for the new member, the CLMV, 98.7% is reduced to zero or to 5%. But by 2015, it's all zero. So for Cambodia, under the small, open economy, we will benefit from this EAC because if you look for the single production base, we are located in the heart of ASEAN. We are the center of gravity for ASEAN. So, so you want to set up operation to Cambodia, we're there, we're ready. Our investment law is very, uh, very generous. We provide the most generous incentive uh, investments uh, to investor. Very friendly government, so we definitely will benefit from EAC. Now, 
the issue people say, oh, you can lose all the job. People come because the free movement of labor from ASEAN to Cambodia. I doubt it. Because we're not going to get the doctor that can pay well in Singapore to go to pay a thousand dollars where you get ten thousand in Singapore, for example. The problem for us may be reverse brain drain that our people, the skilled labor, might migrate to work in the Philippines, to work in, uh, in Singapore, or to work in, uh, in Thailand. The issue that we have to uh, be aware of in the world. So as a result of that, we continue to upgrade our education. We're going to move to vocational training more and more because today there's a mismatch mismatch between the skilled labor that demand by the private sector and the, uh, the people that we produce from our university. Everyone wants to be a PhD, master, master degree, and that's a culture of, of, of Asian. The parents do not want their kid to go to vocational school. They want the kid to get a bachelor degree. So never had to change the mindset. Mindset, that is the issue that Cambodia is facing today short of skilled labor. But overall, I think we're going to benefit from the single production base because of our location and our openness and our investment law that we provide you know, to the investor. And again, we do not restrict any ownership. We talk about uh, services, uh, Secretary Minkus <coughs> talk about the one going to banking, telecom. Cambodia allow foreigners to own 100% banking license, 100% telecom sector insurance, agriculture, every economic sector in Cambodia is open to foreigners, the same. There's no alien business law in Cambodia that differentiate between a foreign investor and a local investor. You all treat equally. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, may, may I turn to Malaysia next, Minister Mustafa Mohammed. If you could get the Malaysian perspective on uh, the AEC progress to date. Uh, and you know what are the remaining challenges from the perspective of Malaysia? Uh, firstly, uh, we look forward to hearing from our private sector colleagues. There's, there's five of us here. We we are half of ASEAN in this room. Yeah? Uh, that goes to show how how powerful this WF in Manila is. Yeah? Uh, we have, uh, you know, this or how powerful <laughs> Secretary Domingo is. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, uh, I think uh, I would like to look at the uh, domestic and the external perspective. Yeah? Uh, domestic will be um, in each individual country how far we've gone and what more needs to be done. Uh, as I said in, in an earlier session, there are two perspectives. One is the private sector, the other is government. From the government side, uh, we've been pushing hard. We've been, there's been some progress. But of course, there are gaps. But uh, if you talk to people in the private sector, they will tell us, ah, you've got a long way to go. Yeah? We're facing so many problems. So there is this, this issue that we need to grapple with. One, the governments, all of us are saying we have made progress in terms of good services. Of course, we recognize we've we got some way to go. But as you talk to the private sector, they, they, by and large, they're quite negative. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done in each individual economies and also at the ASEAN level. Uh, for us, uh, we have benefited uh, a great deal. We have a number of uh, Malaysian companies which have, I'm talking about intra-ASEAN and intra-ASEAN investments. Put it this way, uh, Malaysia or Philippines or Indonesia, Singapore, Cambodia, without ASEAN, yeah, where would we be? I think that's now uh, one uh, useful way of analyzing this issue. It goes to I mean, Myanmar, I think it's very, very telling what you see in Myanmar. If Myanmar will not be part of ASEAN, Myanmar will remain a country. But when you go to Myanmar, you can see how exciting things there are. The airport, uh, you know, is growing and tourism booming. FDI is uh, 4.1 billion last year, 2, 2 billion pre or 1.4 previous year. So Myanmar is a good case study with and without ASEAN. And so that goes to show how <coughs> important ASEAN has been in increasing the, uh, the, the potential uh, of various uh, ASEAN economies. So uh, that's where we are. And for us, uh, I'm, talking, I'm going back, back to uh, intra-ASEAN trade and intra-ASEAN investment. We started with uh, 15 years ago, 15% of trade is within ASEAN. Now it's 25. And I believe in the next five years, it will go to 30 probably will not go beyond that because you have China, a very big country, all of us, for, for all of us, China is the biggest trading partner. So there's been an increase in intra-ASEAN trade with the Philippines, 
I had the pleasure of reviewing our progress this morning with Secretary Domingo. We decided to go line by line. And this demonstrates a commitment to further increase intra-ASEAN trade. So there's good progress there. Number two, there's probably more progress in the area of intra-ASEAN. Yeah? San Miguel from Philippines is in Malaysia, acquired ExxonMobil, and our banks are here, CIMB and uh, Maybank. Uh, Asia, of course, is throughout, throughout uh, the region. We have Saim Dhabi, you know, we have uh, in healthcare, we're in Singapore, and we have Singapore company in Iskanda, we have Malaysian companies in, in, in plantations in Indonesia, we have uh, Indonesia owning a few uh, major hotels, you know, they, yeah, in a big way in Malaysia, a number of uh, top uh, Indonesian corporates. Uh, uh, you know, have, have bought uh, Malaysian hotels. So this is something that that's. And uh, as I say, uh, we have to look at uh, where we are now. Say 30 years ago. So in my view, there's been a lot of progress in respect of uh, intra ASEAN investments and intra ASEAN trade. Having said that, of course, as I mentioned, I would like to repeat, uh, our private sector friends are telling us we've got some way to go. That's the domestic perspective. The other is the global perspective. How people look at us. Yeah? We want to be, we have four pillars. Uh, single production based, uh, comparative economic region. We want to promote uh, equitable economic development. We want to integrate into the global economy. So those, those are the four things. So it is important also to look at, at that perspective. Let me just talk only about one, which is uh, making ASEAN as a single market and production base. And that's happening, yeah? Many of you here, have got operations in uh, Mitsubishi, has got operations in a few ASEAN countries. And there is this supply chain. You know, some companies are in Malaysia. Uh, uh, we, we had what we call the uh, ASEAN Economic Ministers Roadshow last year in the States, uh, LA and San Francisco. And uh, we were given an example of Mattel. Mattel is a toy company, American company. This company has got operations in Thailand, Indonesia and Malaysia, and they complement each other. So uh, we are we are being seen uh, as a single market and production base and this external dimension uh, i think will be further enhanced as we as we uh, achieve a closer economic integration asean in my view will become an even more attractive uh, production uh, base uh, for many multinational companies thank you thank you uh, if i could turn next to senior minister chio so could you kindly give your perspective from the singapore point of view about the progress of AEC and the benefits that Singapore sees coming from the AEC agreement. Certainly, Rajiv. Um, but uh, first, let me say that uh, I was particularly um, attracted to Minister Luffy's comments. Uh, and uh, I scanned the room, especially when he talked about exporting traffic congestion to, to other parts of ASEAN. And I could see all my Singapore compatriots looking very worried. <laughs> uh, but I. I think the larger point um, that uh, Minister Lutfi was trying to make, and uh, especially when he made the declaration that uh, come 2015, what is going to happen? Nothing. Uh, it really suggests uh, an important uh, perspective, which is that I think the ASEAN member states have uh, come together and made tremendous efforts to ensure that we are able to realize the vision of a single market, single production base, which Minister Mustafa also talked about. But uh, there is one uh, area of challenge that I think um, uh, is an area that is also an opportunity if we are to fully realize the idea of uh, ASEAN economic community. And it relates to the whole topic of ASEAN connectivity. When you talk about um, you know, making sure that there's really free flow and services, ASEAN connectivity is central to this. Um, and single market production base is only one of the pillars of the ASEAN economic community. There are three other very important pillars. For example, we would also like to see equitable uh, e development across the whole of ASEAN, and you need connectivity to achieve that. We would also like to see the region becoming very, very competitive. In order to achieve that, we need connectivity. And another very important pillar of um, the ASEAN economic community vision is the idea that uh, we want to be a globally plugged in region. To achieve that, again, we need uh, connectivity. So I thought I would uh, perhaps spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the importance of ASEAN connectivity and what are some of the ways in which we can uh, try and uh, achieve this because it is so central to the vision of the, a successful, effective ASEAN economic community. Um, in fact, um, there is a, a master plan for ASEAN uh, connectivity that has three key priority areas. One 
is we need land connectivity. Um, it's okay to have more cars and more vehicles, provided we have the roads to service them. And, and uh, this is one aspect. Um, another very important aspect is that um, we also need rail connectivity. And so land connectivity as part of ASEAN connectivity is one area that has got challenges, but I also think tremendous opportunities, which I will say a little bit more later. Um, very important uh, aspect of uh, connectivity is air connectivity. And I think later on, Rajiv, I think we can expand a little bit more on that. But um, let's not go too deep into that. A third aspect, I think in today's world, given the kind of technological advances that we're seeing, uh, broadband, uh, cyber connectivity is another very important area. So I think three major pieces in this uh, whole uh, uh, issue and topic on connectivity. Um, what I think it means for businesses is that when you think about the large scale and scope, uh, of uh, investments that will be needed to achieve that connectivity. Uh, it spells to me opportunity. Um, we would like to be able to bring in the resources and expertise, the dialogue partners, and also, of course, the international financial institutions. I think um, yesterday, in the private sessions, we had a very useful discussion on what it means to crowd in um, private uh, investment uh, because of the tremendous amount of liquidity that is available and at the same time the infrastructure development needs are so vast in our region so that is another area of opportunity um, if I may just sum up this part of it by saying that um, where the ASEAN connectivity is uh, concerned I think there are some um, low-hanging fruits um, which have already been achieved um, there is in fact uh, in this um, uh, a master plan, a specific set of measures, and uh, if you look at uh, the uh, number of measures that have been completed or implemented, I think we've gotten to about 70%. Um, but th th those are really the low-hanging fruits. Um, there are the more challenging ones, uh, which I think we can spend a bit more time talking about later. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very, very helpful uh, input. Let, now, we've now heard from the five ASEAN ministers, so it's, I think it's time now to private sector perspective. So we'll turn to our private sector champion on our uh, uh, panel today and ask you to represent all the private sector views. Uh, but of course, you're representing the views particularly of Japan, you know, one of Asia's two big economic superpowers. And since Prime Minister Abe came to office, we've seen that he's very much engaged with the ASEAN region. He's managed to visit all the ASEAN countries in mm. the short time mm. that he's already been in office. So it's really a signal of the great commitment of Japan to ASEAN. And we also see a lot of investment flows coming from Japanese companies to the ASEAN region. Um, so I wonder if we could get your perspective um, as the chairman of Mitsubishi Corporation, which has evolved more from a trading house, now much more into a an investment uh, focus in terms of your activities and get your perspective on ASEAN. How do you as a Japanese bus business leader and chairman of Mitsubishi Corporation see that ASEAN looks as in terms of attractiveness of investment other emerging market regions? Uh, so if you could give your comments on how you see the opportunities from your company's perspective in the region. Rajiv-san, thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, I personally feel it's a very tough work <laughs> to speak. My, besides, my position is the center of this group. Huh? And uh, I myself is a personal businessman. And uh, frankly speaking, ASEAN is a very, very important region for Japan. As uh, uh, Rajiv-san explained, uh, recently, Abe administrations has uh, focused on the partnership with ASEAN. And uh, he visited all of ASEAN countries in 10 countries within one year. <laughs> and uh, ending up with the ASEAN summit in Tokyo. And uh, he had a very good meeting with the uh, ASEAN uh, Prime Minister and uh, President in Japan. And uh, that's very good good for our businessmen and uh, to encourage our business in uh, Asian countries. And uh, uh, maybe, you know, 
say uh, in ASEAN, our company Mitsubishi Corporation has uh, 24 offices in 10 countries. And uh, uh, already uh, 10 billion US dollars we have committed for the investment. Uh, that's a very, very uh, big investment. And uh, as uh, Rajiv san explained, used to be Mitsubishi Corporation as a trading company. Trading at that time, and uh, all this, uh, we are the so called trading company. And uh, however, now trading profit is a 20 to 30 percentage. 70 to 80 percentage are coming from the investment. And uh, everybody said, now you are changing your business model from the uh, trading company to the uh, investment banker. No, no. We invest not only uh, money, but also human resources. We send a, uh, more than 200 CEO to the uh, 600 subsidiary companies throughout the world and how to add the value for the investment companies. That's very important. And uh, not only in Japan, but also say, uh, maybe um, uh, now there's so many investment in ASEAN countries. And therefore, there are so many people, Japanese Mitsubishi Corporation people are working in the ASEAN countries. Uh, therefore, it's good for me to visit ASEAN countries, uh, to have a meeting with uh, our staff working in those countries and uh, to communicate each other. Uh, talking about our Mitsubishi Group companies, Mitsubishi Motors or Mitsubishi Electrics, Mitsubishi Bank, so many Mitsubishi Group companies. Then uh, everybody here is now, Mitsubishi Corporation is the holding company of the total Mitsubishi Group companies. N no. <laughs> Only one independent trading company. But uh, of course, we are communicating each other. Uh, but uh, in total, 28 Mitsubishi group companies. However, we are working sometimes with other groups and sometimes other countries. And that is very important, particularly from now on. And uh, the business is getting more global and global. And uh, we have. Uh, 200 offices in 90 countries throughout the world. And uh, that's very, very important. Therefore, we can collect the uh, information throughout the world. What is changing of the uh, policies, or the changing of the economies, and so forth. And also, we need a very reliable partner country by country to communicate to each other. In that sense, in Asian countries, we have uh, so many uh, intimate uh, reliable partners country by country and that's the reason why I'm very happy to be here this time and uh, to have uh, opportunity to communicate each other and uh, this is the basis of our uh, investment and circumstances and uh, ASEAN is uh, very very important particularly for the future and uh, particularly next year 2015 AEC will be concluded. This is a very, very good trigger or opportunity to strengthen the relationship connectivity. That is a very, very important. ASEAN, you know, the, uh, the economy is the, uh, maybe the number one in the world right now. Latin America, particularly West Coast, is also good. And uh, I myself is the chairman of the japan Columbia Economic Committee, and uh, I heard from them they have, uh, you know, so-called Pacific found, uh, federations in Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico. Those uh, four countries are seriously watching the ASEAN countries, how to develop the business together. And quite recently, this is one example, uh, we established the, uh, some companies uh, in Malaysia and together with the Colombian. Japanese and Colombian companies established one company, joint venture, in Malaysia. This kind of uh, business model will be increasing. Therefore, uh, our position is uh, how to give those uh, global information to ASEAN countries. And this, that's very important. Besides, uh, 
uh, our role is uh, uh, particularly a uh, financial support and also investment business and establishing a new business, uh, you know, joint ventures, country by country. But for that purpose, important issue is the government and government, those ASEAN countries and Japan should intimate. In that sense, our Prime Minister Abe's, you know, policy is very good for us. And uh, under such circumstances, AEC is good. And uh, also, uh, companies, uh, uh, government and government discuss and uh, how to uh, change the regulation and rules each other. This kind of uh, concept is very, very good for us. We can, we are very much prepared to give any suggestion and uh, any idea to the government and also to the uh, our partner countries. Therefore, under such circumstances, I do hope ASEAN countries' uh, uh, economy is now going up. And uh, we are very much prepared to support from the financial viewpoint, from the technology viewpoint, or from the uh, environmental viewpoint. And those are the very important uh, in uh, globally. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that private sector perspective. Um, so we've heard from uh, uh, Chairman Kojima-san about the importance of the implementation of the AEC. If I could again turn to you, Secretary Domingo, and get your sense of the, the benefits of the AEC in terms of the liberalization of cross-border investment flows uh, from the Philippines perspective. Um, there is a sense of, I guess, anticipation, at least from Japan, that, that this liberalization will help investment flows. Ha, ha, are there concerns in the Philippines about the liberalization of the investment barriers? Uh, yeah. There's always a uh, concern uh, from, in particular, the SMEs. But I would say that, uh, in general, liberalization has worked very well for the Philippines. Uh, it's definitely made uh, many of our sectors uh, very competitive, not only regionally, but globally. And uh, it has allowed us to, to outperform, outperform in many sectors. Uh, many Many of our industries still have to be improved, but many of our industries are already globally competitive, in particular our electronics, our ICT. We are a very big ICT center with uh, over a million people now uh, doing that uh, outsourcing work for the, for the world. Uh, we are competitive in high-end garments. We are uh, competitive in many other things, well, furniture, etc. Now, the so so we welcome actually the continued liberalization. In, in fact, in the in the enabling trade uh, survey of I think the World Economic Forum, we 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 rank very high, if I'm not mistaken, eighth uh, globally. In terms of the barriers, uh, we are one of the countries with the least barriers to trade. Uh, we we will continue to take that, that position, uh, but we really need to address the concern of the SMEs. As mentioned earlier, there are uh, there's very little awareness of ASEAN at the ground roots uh, level. And since we're now tackling the more difficult portions of the free trade agreements, uh, not only for ASEAN, but also in WTO uh, and other uh, bilateral arrangements, uh, they, they're becoming more ambitious in their objective. So as you get into the more sensitive parts, you really need much more broad, much broader support from the population and in particular the, the business population. And uh, the bulk of that support will be from the SMEs. So without the political support from the SMEs, it will be to master the political will to move very aggressively on the free trade agenda. And that's why we have to make a lot of changes in the way we do free trade agreements so that uh, a lot of the benefits can be felt by the SMEs. Because right now, if I'm, if I'm a small company in the Philippines, wanting to export to Thailand or to Indonesia or to any of our neighbors you know, to, be, to avail of the free trade agreements, there's voluminous work involved, including the rules of origin, you know, 
proving the rules of origin that you comply with them, etc. So the, the rules and regulations are really meant for big companies. They're not uh, designed for small companies. And so we need to kind of make changes to ensure that the SMEs can participate in an easy manner. We make, have to make the rules very simple for small companies so that they can feel the effect of or the benefits of a free trade agreement. Without that, I think it's very hard to push very aggressively on the free trade agenda. Thank you. If I could turn now to Minister Lutfi again about this issue of investment. Indonesia has been large increases in foreign direct investment flows in the last three or four years. Uh, but how do you see the AEC is going to change the landscape? And what are the challenges you're facing politically, domestically, in terms of the uh, liberalizing the investment landscape to further? Well, as the used to be the chair of the investment board, so I have this experience. I left for Japan for three. So I left. I, I left Jakarta after the investment board. Went to Japan. Came back. I look at it and I go like, Oh my God! This is like a bad dreams. Whatever I did in 2009, I'm doing it again 2012, uh, 2014. So, the question, do we have a problem with investment coming from foreign countries? Okay. The numbers shows we don't have a problem. But then, my Japanese investor is very detailed. How come in the past, negative list looks like this, and this one doesn't look like that? Okay. So, to be honest, this is the largest democracy in the world. People say India is the largest democracy, but Prime Minister Modi will be elected by 500 people in the parliament. The second largest, they said, the United States. Obama was elected by 58 million people. Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono was elected by 73 million people. So, this is the largest democracy. <laughs> and with that, with that, like in Japan, like in Japan, things move very slowly. And I do not want to be, to be lectured at parliament of what do I need to do to protect the country. But it's a small times that they realize right away. And the time leaps is getting closer and closer. For example, Ten years ago, 2005, only 15 million people flies in Indonesia. Okay? Five years ago, that number tripled to 45. Now, 90 million people fly. So what happened? Making Jakarta Sukarno Hatta Airport with the capacity of 16 million people now is bigger than Changi Airport. 3.8 million people traveling to uh, Jakarta International Airport making Jakarta International Airport the scariest airport in the world. Okay? <laughs> so, what's, what happened? Last five years, between Lion Air, Garuda, and this low-cost carrier bought probably 600 aircraft. Two years ago, my predecessor, Gita Wiryawan, had a problem with a trade deficit. Why? Because we bought so many airplanes. Mm -hmm. And this is deemed to be a consumption, part of the consumptions. So then, we have to hire international pilots. You know, these pilots come from European, Southern European. So if you go with Lion Air, you can hear the English is different. The Indonesian is completely different. <laughs> <laughs> so in five, five, ten years ago, we have a problem hiring international pilots. Today, we don't. Why? Because we have more airplanes and pilots. So this is what's happening in the country. Like, like uh, my colleague from Ka Cambodia also happened. The, 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 the services is okay. So the first part when I, well, I took this job Valentine's Day, okay? It's Valentine's Day. So like the third day, the a doctor association came to my office and I said, by 2015, January, a lot of doctors from Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand will come and swamp the, the, the in, Indonesia. The number of doctors and patients in the country is one to a thousand, okay? The number of specialists is like one to exponentially a thousand. So this is crazy. So I asked, Professor, where are you coming from? From the city of Makassar in Sulawesi. So he took four patients at one point, you know, so, you know, they just sat and put the recipe for five medicine. 
So one of those might, you know, get the, 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 the disease. So I said, how much do you get paid? He says, 300,000, roughly about 30 bucks. Okay? A specialist in Singapore costs 300 Singapore dollars to 500. So I told the, the professor, professor, would it be reasonable for Singapore doctors to learn how to speak Indonesian? And we'll go to the city of Makassar and live in house in Singapore. I'm afraid you're going to learn how to speak English and start practicing in Malaysia and Singapore. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to swap that with that too, Mr. <laughs> Theo. So it's just, it's just a small realizations. So do I have a problem with cross-border investment? We may retract some more likely in the, in the services. But trust me, this is a democratic country. It takes 15 years to clear Rapongi Hills, right? Kaicho <laughs> Sama. <laughs> That also happening in the country, but the realization is getting sooner and faster. So, like I said before, nothing is easy in Indonesia, but then again, nothing is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have no issue. If there is issue, but the issue will become solved frequently and faster. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Minister Chiu, if I can turn back to you now. We heard a little bit about the rapid growth of aviation in Indonesia. So I think it's a good point to drill down a little bit into some of the detail uh, on the ASEAN Open Agreement that's due to be implemented next year. How do you see the challenges around that and uh, the benefits as well, particularly given Singapore is such a major global aviation hub? I was just reflecting what it would mean. Um, and the congestion is exported to Singapore, as well as uh, medical professionals from all over the region start practicing in Singapore. It's a lot to chew on. Huh? Uh, perhaps uh, turning to a topic that uh, you uh, wanted a specific comment on, on um, air connectivity. Um, earlier on, my colleagues had highlighted that uh, the demand for air travel in our part of the world, and air transport in our part of the world, is going to grow very, very rapidly. And this, this is um, really driven by the fact that um, um, the growing middle class uh, in, uh, in Asia is going to exceed the size of the middle class in uh, North America and Europe combined. And it's not going to take a very long time for this to be realized. It's, the estimate is 2030, I would say plus minus three to five years. And when you think about 2030, it may sound like a very long way off, uh, but a child that is being born today will be eligible to vote in any country by the time we get to 2030. So that just sort of gives you a sense of how, and those of us who have children know how the children grow very quickly. That's, that's actually not a very far uh, timeline at all. And um, uh, there's one thing to share, and if you think about just 2014 specifically, um, of the estimated 800 million new passengers on air travel this year, about half of them will originate from Asia. So that's very significant growth potential for aviation um, in our part of the region. And if we look at ASEAN uh, specifically, the middle class population by 2030 is again going to be about 50%. And uh, we're talking about two thirds of them living in cities. So in an urban setting, and in other words, um, uh, interested to travel, and probably able to afford air travel. And so um, that's the kind of backdrop that we're operating again. And um, uh, the ASEAN Open Skies, which is uh, coming about in 2015, Secretary Domingo also talked about, um, if we want to have a sense of what that's going to mean for ASEAN, um, the EU single aviation market is uh, possibly a reference point. If you re recall, uh, the EU single aviation market came about in the 80s and in the 90s. And um, if that's anything to go by, we can expect in ASEAN a multifold increase in the number of flights and direct city links. Uh, Minister Lutfi talked about the very large number of uh, airplanes that Lion has ordered. Um, today, I mean, to, if we are very honest about it, there is a, a fair bit of overcapacity, especially in the low-cost sector. But I think, you know, um, it is a matter of timing. Uh, it causes some pressure on the businesses concerned, but the demand is likely to grow. And in order, you know, to, to satisfy the traveling 
uh, preferences of um, the, the, the public as well as for business needs. So again, back to the EU single aviation market, multifold increase in number of flights, direct city links, and of course with that, I think you can also look forward to reduce cost of air travel, whether it, whether it is for passenger travel or whether it is for freight. Um, and uh, I think it goes beyond just um, this idea of a single aviation market being all about uh, uh, demand for air travel. It is also that um, there has been tremendous effort made in harmonizing the technical regulatory requirements um, of uh, our region. And I would say, therefore, then it uh, then begs the question, what would be the challenges and what would be the opportunities standing in the way of the growth? I think challenges, a very simple uh, challenge that we all face is uh, airport capacity is really up to this. And this is true um, of many airports uh, in our part of the world. So there is a lot of uh, um, uh, need as well as opportunity to invest in airport infrastructure uh, in order to grow the capacity. Um, I would also say that uh, beyond just uh, investing in airport infrastructure and making the slots available for air travel, uh, another very important area of opportunity which I think uh, deserves greater attention is how air transport agreement uh, can be further liberalized. Um, as a bloc, I think ASEAN has made tremendous progress. Uh, we have an air transport agreement with China. I think that is a very significant development. It would have been a bit harder for each one of us to get all those uh, air, travel air transport agreements done, but as a bloc, we've been able to do it with China. In the works are air transport agreements with um, Japan, um, Korea, and um, possibly also India. Um, and um, developments in, in, in India are particularly encouraging from that perspective. We hope that we will be able to secure further momentum on the air transport agreement. And something that is also possibly a very exciting development. Um, today, when you think of air transport agreements, very often it's between countries. Um, as a region, we have been able to achieve agreement with China and then some other perhaps along the way. But there is potential for a region to region, a world first, region to region air transport agreement. And that is between ASEAN and the European Union. Um, just a few months ago, um, when Singapore held the um, uh, aviation summit um, uh, was raised, uh, there is definitely interest on the part of uh, ASEAN member states. And uh, we also see growing interest amongst uh, EU states. Um, it, it's not easy. It will take some time to materialize. But that, again, is uh, potentially something that uh, could be a game changer, an air transport agreement between EU and um, ASEAN. So that's something that uh, is worth paying attention to. Thank you very much. Uh, if I could turn uh, to you, Senior Minister Chantal, to talk about other aspects of connectivity uh, from the Cambodian perspective in terms of other forms of infrastructure, where do you see the priorities in terms of Cambodia's priorities for connectivity? Thank you very much. Uh, just like uh, Mr. Tell mentioned about connectivity, it's important for ASEAN if you want to EAC to be successful. And in ASEAN's uh, connectivity master plan, there's one major project in Cambodia, a flagship project called Singapore Kunling Railing Project that connect the train from Singapore, Malaysia, to Thailand, to Cambodia, and to Vietnam, and then to Kunming, China. So we do our part right now, first, to connect Cambodia Railway to the State Railroad Thailand. So at least good, and people can travel from Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and to Cambodia. That's the first part. The second part would be the second missing link that connect Cambodia to Vietnam. Now, the ASEAN leaders, as I agree, committed since 1995 to get this missing link done by 2015. But today, we have not realized that project because of lack of funding. So, Cambodia will not, obviously, cannot invest alone $700 million for that missing link. And if we only one or two train per day, so economically, it's not good for Cambodia to invest in the $700 million projects. But as an ASEAN, we should look into, look, who will benefit from all this? All the way from Singapore to China. So maybe each country that benefit from this will have to work together with Cambodia to contribute to build this missing link. 
so that they can ship goods all the way to, to China. But for also upgrade our deep sea port in Sydneyville. We just built a new container port on along the Mekong River. So both deep sea port of Sydneyville and the Mekong River port is being built. We invest heavily in the road that connecting Cambodia with Vietnam, Cambodia with Thailand, Cambodia with Laos is part of ASEAN uh, uh, highway network system. So we're doing a lot, but still not enough. So we need the private sector to participate in major infrastructure, i.e. build the major highway linking economic pole of Phnom Penh to Silver Pole, a four-lane highway, for example, to our deep seaport. So we encourage the private sector to participate in this PPP project and in infrastructure in Cambodia. Power plant. We also invest heavily in power plant that on hydro, but again, this is based on the participation of the private sector. We do not have enough funding to do our soil, so we rely on the private sector to participate in, in inf infrastructure in, in Cambodia. Now, the issues not only infrastructure. In the master plan, we talk about institution connectivity, the legal framework. You have a road, a railway, but if we do not agree on the cross-border agreement, we still cannot establish as of today the ASEAN single window. I don't think we can get it done by 2015. And we try, but I don't think we're going to get it done. So we've got to start with a national single window first. Or can it get done? For example, let's take one issue with custom. We can send our custom from Cambodia to sit on the water on the Vietnamese side to work there for a single window, single stop. But the Vietnamese custom cannot come to Cambodia because the, the law in Vietnam does not allow them to come to work in Cambodia. Okay? So unless that change, we're going to have a problem. The bottleneck is the software, not the hardware. Hardware is one side, but the software is a major issue that ASEAN leaders need to work together to improve that institutional connectivity. All, you know, all the good highways and the, 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 the port and all, we not work. Thank you very Thank you. much for those comments. I'm going to open this up in a moment to questions from the floor. So if you have a question, if you could raise your hand. But while you're thinking of your questions, let me uh, ask Minister Mustafa Mohammed to give some thoughts on the linkages between the AEC and other trade liberalization initiatives in the Asia Pacific. There's been obviously a lot of focus on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and also the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership as well. How do you see the links between these initiatives? How important is the AEC as a foundation block for some of these other trade liberalization uh, initiatives? Let me uh, go back to the preceding discussion. Give me a minute or so before I move to the uh, sure. question of EEC. Two points. One is uh, the development of border towns uh, between, uh, say, Thailand and Malaysia, and Cambodia and uh, Thailand, and Malaysia, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, Malaysia. This is something that's, that's gaining momentum. And uh, uh, in our experience, border towns are booming. For example, in north between Malaysia and Thailand, we got this, uh, uh, we're building a big facility, uh, a bigger facility uh, to uh, facilitate travel and goods and services in Malaysia and Thailand, spending more than 100 million US dollars between Malaysia and Singapore, the high speed rail, which will be a game changer. And between Brunei and Malaysia, we just opened a friendship bridge. Between uh, Philippines and Malaysia, we are. Uh, been talking about air connectivity and you know seaports, so that's that's something that that, that I would like to share with you. That border towns uh, are growing, uh, and we get uh, this is getting support from various national governments. Number two, I think there's a change of mindset. There was a time when we we talked about we were we were competing with each other, you know, cutthroat competition. Now more and more is about collaboration. Yeah. So five years ago, aviation, we all want to be hubs: Bangkok, Singapore. Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, but now we have become, all of Manila, all of us are becoming hubs because growth in air travel, BD class. So there was a meeting. Now, because the market is growing yeah, so rapidly, yeah, uh, we are talking about collaboration. 
collaboration with the Malaysian, Singapore, and you know, in various areas. So this, I think, I, I thought I would like to share a very important point. One is the growth of border towns. Uh, secondly, this ASEAN mindset is coming in strongly uh, in the form uh, of collaboration instead of cutthroat competition. Next, uh, let me return to your question on the EC. Uh, this issue of ASEAN centrality, which is very important to us. We have five ministers here. You know, uh, whatever we do, we want to preserve the importance of ASEAN. So when we talked to Japan, we started with what we call ASEAN plus one. Uh, with Japan, China, and Australia, New Zealand, India. We've done that. Now we're moving into what we call RCEP. Yeah? And this is, uh, we have finished four rounds. Uh, we're going uh, bigger. So this RCEP uh, is an initiative to further enhance the benefits of all the trade agreements we have signed. So we are committed to free trade, all of us. We have benefited a lot, benefited a lot from uh, AFTA, which is ASEAN free trade. We have benefited a lot from ASEAN plus one. Now we're moving one stage further, which is RCEP. And this is uh, an indication how, how open we are, how important trade is. And finally, um, uh, four of us are involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We finished uh, a day ago in Singapore, a two-day meeting, uh, which is Malaysia, uh, Brunei, Singapore and Vietnam. Uh, and uh, we see this. All these uh, is, uh, are being seen as complementary to whatever we have. So we have ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, we have ASEAN Japan China, what we call ASEAN Plus One, we have RCEP, we now have Trans-Pacific Partnership. All of us are of the view that this will further strengthen ASEAN. Yeah? This, you know, I mean, uh, it is very uh, uh, to, uh, we, we are we're confident that all these initiatives will further strengthen ASEAN to make ASEAN an even more attractive uh, base for uh, production and also will become more competitive. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could ask uh, uh, Chairman Kojima-san, uh, for Japan, the TPP has now become a very important part of the reform agenda. Do you see the linkages in terms of TPP uh, and the AEC working together in terms of helping your uh, overall you know, access to markets in the Asia Pacific? Well, TPP is very, very important. I always uh, communicate with the government, we should conclude the TPP as soon as possible. And also FTA is also very important. And in that sense, AEC is also very important. And uh, this will be very you know, good for the economy for each country, and besides globally. That is my idea. Then uh, talking about the investments, I'm just looking for the, uh, what kind of investment we did. <laughs> And uh, what kind of investment is related to the uh, PPP? And uh, I, we invested, firstly, resource investment, metal resources and uh, energy resources. Those are very important for Japan. Japan doesn't have uh, resources. <laughs> that is number one. And then number two is the uh, investment for the manufacturing industries in Thailand and Indonesia and some of the automobile industries we are involved in. Them. And uh, the, therefore, manufacturing industry is very, very important. And besides, uh, retail industries and uh, superstore or convenience store, now we are investing, not only in Japan, but also the other foreign countries as well. But the very important investment is the infrastructure investment. Infrastructure is uh, electric power and uh, water business, and also the uh, uh, railway business, and uh, sometimes uh, port facility we are requested to invest. And so many infrastructure businesses now coming out. And uh, however, as far as the infrastructure business is concerned, we need uh, support from the government of each country. And uh, besides that, the Japanese government and the, those countries' government have to communicate with each other. And the private company cannot resolve the every problem about the infrastructure. But the investment is still there. And also, from now, financial investment business, finance business. And also, and uh, how to uh, develop the uh, cities and uh, hospitals and so forth. And therefore, from now on, investment is uh, changing. 
but all those investments are related to the ASEAN countries. Therefore, what, what's the best way is the yeah, TPP or uh, AEC or and so forth, but uh, uh, we have to analyze uh, what kind of risk, what kind of uh, uh, benefit for those countries. This is a very, very important uh, role we have to play. Thank you so much. I'd really like to now have some questions from the floor. Uh, you've got this wonderful panel here. Uh, you've got access to some of the key ministers in ASEAN. So please do ask questions. We have one question here first. Um, is there a mic that can come here? I thought maybe just speak because it's a small room. I don't know. There doesn't seem to. spoke about you know all the rules are for the big companies I come from a reasonably large company we have investments across however Does any panel member want to pick that one up? Minister Lutfi, maybe, would you want to <laughs> comment on that? Well, I, I, I can see the, the, the wisdom behind it. But nevertheless, this is like a company going into a tender. The friends, they know each other. Well, when they go to tender, you know, for healing or for qualifications, they sit on different desks and it seems like they don't know each other. This is what we're facing. But, like I said, the trend is going to be united. What Minister Tio says about, about uh, connectivity, I think there is a path, there's a silver lining in it. Right now, Indonesia is the stubborn kid in the system. Why? We have, we have right now about 90 airports. We are opening five, okay? Another 143 airports. And by the way, this is all Indonesian made. Make, you know, it will not be international make. So we will be the largest constructions of airports. And this is, so next time I'm gonna to go to Cambodia and start selling airports. <laughs> but, you know, now the issues is very simple. I ask, this is Indonesian versions of Tony Fernandez, but this is very humble. You know, Tony owns a soccer team. This one does not own anything. His name is Rusdi Kirana, the president of Lion Air. So I asked him, Rusdi, you ordered 279 from Boeing, you ordered another 250 from Airbus. So where are you going to park the airplane? He looked at me and says, Boss, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> So now he's gonna buy more, you know. <laughs> my thought is, my immediate thought is, and this is before I took, I took this, you know, this is a, you know, I'm, I'm a relief driver. I'm supposed to do something else right now, retiring from the government. So after coming back from Tokyo, I asked him that question. My thought before taking this job, great. My thought was, why don't, instead of having these airports across the country, why don't I stop, why don't I get his, his airplane to stop in, in Cambodia, in Siam Reap, some in Luang Prabang, in, 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 uh, in, in Laos, you know, maybe some somewhere in Chiang Mai or Chiang Rai, start flying their own routes in sight. Because I don't think Rusdi Kirana can be beaten by anybody in ASEAN. 
my truly belief. So one day, one day, I believe, Minister Tio, we're going to sit down instead of having this, you know, fifth freedom, fourth freedom, whatever freedom, just erase this. Just say that this airport just like a parking lot. So it will be toward that way. You know, it may take a while, but it will go toward that way. And this is will the same with investment also. Right now, Indonesia also the stubborn kid in the system right now because we are very hesitant, you know, to do, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, FTA and everything like that. For one reason, because we are market right now. Our objective in 2017 will be amounted to be $10 billion. That $10 billion today will be the second largest export from Indonesia after crude palm oil. Can you imagine that? Suddenly, I'm exporting a high-value technology with absorptions of developed skilled labor as automotive. Second biggest export. So after this, I want to know why I cannot sell cars at Minister Zeo's house. Why only police car in, uh, in the Philippines using Kijang Innova, Toyota Innova. I want him to drive my Toyota too to make sure trade agreement with this country to be efficient. So now Indonesia from a stubborn kid will be an aggressive kid, kid and maybe abrasive as well. So it's just a matter of time. Watch everybody, stubborn kid to be aggressive kid. <laughs> Thanks so much. Another question here, um, please. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, heard about 2030 uh, and all the connectivity. I didn't hear anything about uh, talent, about people, you know, the skill development, because you have a declining population in Japan. You got, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, amount of population in the Philippines, Indonesia. What, are, what is the strategy to bring it all together to leverage, you know, people and the strength of the talent that we probably have in this region for, you know, f looking at uh, competing with the rest, with the rest of the world? And uh, how do you train more of Japanese uh, in the Philippines, uh, you know, for supporting Japan in the future for services, you know? Uh, and what do you do about uh, you know, leveraging this region for, uh, you know, South-South trade, Latin America, you know, which is a, which is a market which is as, as, a, as a strategy. We talked about this air traffic connectivity. 60% of the Emirates Airlines uh, viability or traffic today is actually people going from India to the rest of the world, uh, through Dubai, of course, uh, in transit. So I'm just wondering what is the, you know, two areas. One, of course, with the talent. And otherwise, in terms of what are we doing about ASEAN uh, strategy to compete with the rest of the world as one, one entity, and especially Latin America, for example. So could you like to comment about the talent? Yes. Uh, actually, I can only talk about the Philippine side. Uh, uh, and I, I think uh, Mr. Kumar is uh, with the ITBPO sector here in the Philippines, uh, a big player. Uh, we've actually done a lot of work in terms of making structural change in terms of the education and training of our people. Uh, for example, we passed a law that completely restructured the primary and secondary education in the Philippines, uh, where we brought it now to, to uh, international st standard, what we call a K plus 12 program, kindergarten plus 12 years of primary and secondary. And that's being implemented through 2017. So by 2017, we'll be fully compliant with that. We've uh, increased the education budget by over 50% over the last three years. We've um, initiated a lot of new training programs under the government. Uh, and they're very nice programs. We, we, the TESDA, uh, that's the training organization of the government, uh, is able to train about 1.5 million people every year. And many of the programs, uh, including the training for the EPO industry, uh, there, the curriculum was developed by the industry itself, but it's being funded by the government in terms of training. An example I'll, I'll mention is for the electronics industry. We have training programs that are embedded in the actual electronics uh, producers, uh, products producers. So they, they are trained in a factory that produces electronics products. And the government subsidizes that uh, training, and we train thousands of people every year. Uh, and uh, you know that it's a very successful program because over 
of those trained when they get off the program are immediately hired by the industry. So, and then we also do that now for machining. We started for the machining and many other things. So like this thing is telling us we have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, quick, quick well, in, in, just in a quick thing, uh, we believe that there is no substitute really for the training and education of the human resources. If we want to bring people out of poverty, then the, the only way to build the playing field is by educating the people properly. Right. Yeah. Please. Uh, it's an extremely important area. And it so happens that I was having a conversation with uh, Secretary Arsenio Palisakan, who is the uh, man in charge of socioeconomic planning in Singapore, and uh, in, sorry, in the Philippines. And he said something that I think resonates with us uh, also in Singapore. He said that the path to poverty reduction really boils down to two things. One, you need to do job creation. And a lot of what we are doing here is really trying to promote job creation. But he said a second thing, which was very insightful. He said difficulty that we have today is that we don't have uh, enough of a matching of the skills that are needed by industry and what is being produced by the education system. This is the experience of Singapore too. And even today, we challenge ourselves by asking whether our kids in the school system will have the skills that industry will need 10, 15, 20 years from now. And I think this, boils, uh, this points to one very important uh, uh, contribution that the private sector can make, which is that in the way we structure our education system, in the way in which we design the curriculum, the private sector input is very important. You can't have education professionals just thinking about the future and what skills need to be imbibed in, in the people that are going through the system. You actually need people in industry, you need people who are in touch with the technology developments, you need people who understand the shape of the economy in the future, feeding back that input into the education system so that you can have proper matching of skills needed by industry and what education systems are producing. So I thought I'd just share that. I think that's really fundamental. Yeah. I think we can squeeze in one more very <laughs> quick question here and then we'll probably have that's, to stop. That's very kind of you, thank you. I'm Jeff Lipman and I'm a member of the Global Agenda Council on the Future of Tourism. And listening to all of the discussion, you, there's a, and particularly the comments of Minister Lutfi on the potential for the generalization, as, as I would put it, of these reforms which are going to lead to large air movements of people. We have been working for five years on the idea of an electronic fee. You have the framework for that in, in ASEAN. If you don't move the people about, then you won't get the advantage of it. And my question is, what prospect do you see for an e-visa-based solution system for moving people around the ASEAN region? That's a great question and relevant for the whole of Asia. Um, maybe I could ask Minister Mustafa Mohammed to comment on that. Well, it's just uh, a matter of time. Everything has gone electronic now. Uh, so the question is, uh, when do you want this to happen? I mean, for you, tomorrow or now, yeah? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's something that's on the cards. Uh, many things are electronic. For example, on, on customs, we've we got this uh, uh, pilot project, what we call a national single window. And this is to facilitate uh, movement of goods between ASEAN countries. So electronic initiatives are already in place in ASEAN. And it's just a matter of time. Uh, we, we've been talking about this, uh, I think, in, in Davos as well, in January this year, about, about, about visas, electronic visas, and there are systems in place. In my view, to cut the story short, I think uh, it's, it's just a matter of time that this initiative is uh, embraced by ASEAN member states. Thank you. I'm sorry that because of the limited time and because we've got a back-to-back -back after this, I can't actually take more questions, much as I would love to continue this discussion, but I've been asked to conclude uh, on time. So I'd like to end the session by thanking our really excellent panel. Um, I would particularly like to say how dynamic this panel is, and I'm very encouraged uh, by the enthusiasm that we see with the ASEAN ministers here. And I would like to also present each of you, and I'll only give one, but I'll give the others later, a book about the future of Asia. And I think in your hands, this our future of Asia is in very, very capable uh, management. So th please thank our wonderful panel for their contribution.
You have just seen the interactive session, Connect on Trade, Lifting Barriers to Growth, that was held at the Kalapan Ballroom of Makati Shangri-La Hotel. I am being joined by JC Tejano. Uh, Robert Tan had to leave a while ago, but uh, uh, JC will be uh, continuing this coverage. Mm -hmm. After news at one. Yes, uh, we'll be with you uh, for the rest of the afternoon. And uh, we witnessed uh, in this uh, uh, forum or in this uh, symposium uh, the discussion on the possibility of free trade in ASEAN. I think uh, it's a, it, it was a very important announcement from uh, Secretary Domingo that the Philippines is committed uh, to free trade. However, uh, there are pro probably uh, several considerations that have to be made, uh, particularly uh, while we were talking a while ago, uh, Kathy on a comparative advantage, the niche of the Philippines, what will be our uh, main products uh, for this possib possible free trade area. Secretary Domingo has also discussed the benefits of uh, trade liberalization on the Philippine economy, but he also said that there are several concerns with regard to SMEs and the need to improve the laws and the regulation with regard to small and medium enterprises. We will continue our special coverage of the World Economic Forum on East Asia after our newscast, so please stay tuned. JC Tejano and Attorney JJ Atienza will be joining. You. Good afternoon, I'm Kathy San Gabriel. Good afternoon, I'm Jay.